everyone. Happy Thursday. It's another Tech Strong kind of gang day. And uh, we've got, you know, the EU is on the warpath looking for some Microsoft scalps, it seems. We've got Broadcom still trying to figure out that VMware kind of puzzle. And is NVIDIA sustainable? I'm not talking about their stock price. All that and more today on Tech Strong Gang. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday edition of Tech Strong Gang here. We're happy to have you join us. As I mentioned in the opening, we've got uh, the EU on the warpath. We've got Broadcom VMware news, and we've got a little NVIDIA as well as a special roll bob at the end of today's show. But before we jump into it, let me introduce you to our gang members for today. Our, our first, uh, well, first up, I always like to lead with Mitchell. Mitchell uh, Ashley, who is a CTA with Futurum Group, as well as our CTO here, and a regular on the gang. Mitchell, good to have you on today. Everything well? Great to be here. Everything's uh, great in uh, Colorado State. All righty. Well, starting off in Colorado, we're going to go further west where our next two gang members are today. They're both out in Cali in the Bay Area, I think. Um, Let me first introduce you to our Shiny new penny of an editor here, John Swartz. John, <laughs> I've never been described you on. that way, but thank you very much for saying it, for terming it that way to turn a phrase. Damn. You've never been described as a pretty shiny new penny? <laughs> no. <laughs> Probably not. And then also joining us in California, she's been on with us before. She's from the future group and a marketing expert and just a great, I, I enjoy having her on our shows with us. It's our gang member, Lisa Martin. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Doing great, Alan. Thrilled to be back on the Tech Strong Gang. Cannot wait to break into these topics today. Fantastic. It's good to have you on. And then joining me here and in the uh, Tech Strong HQ in Boca Raton, Florida, not sunny Boca Raton, Florida, I'll add today, it's rainy, is our Echo Insights Editor and Analyst for Sustainability and All Things Green IT, Bonnie Schneider. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Alan. Thanks to ha- thank you for coming here and coming in. Um, all right. So as I mentioned, the, you know the EU, they, these guys they don't they take no prisoners and then they don't mess around. They are now after Microsoft for bundling teams. It seems, John, you wrote an article over on TechStrong ITSM around it. Why don't you kick us off here? What's the story? Sure. I, I guess it's Microsoft's turn in the barrel with the uh, regulatory issues. So the EU, as you said, is investigating Microsoft's bundling of Teams to Office 365 and Microsoft 365. They think it's unfair competition for Slack and others. The investigation kind of dates back to a 2020 lawsuit that was filed by Slack, which has since been acquired by Salesforce. Microsoft did make some modifications for Teams in Europe, but it, apparently it wasn't enough. Now they're facing fines of up to 10% of their annual revenue, which would be about $20 billion dollars. And it's scrambling to address the issue through its president, who's uh, Brad Smith. Now, this interesting to me is that this is the same Brad Smith who, over the past several years, has adopted an almost holier-than-thou attitude about big tech adhering to regulatory law as well. Microsoft largely went unscathed. You know, Microsoft's advantage was they had the big face-off showdown with the Justice Department in the 90s, for predominantly in the 90s, and could have learned how to stay on the good side of the law. But um, now, there are... uh, targeted the EU action. And it's interesting, Alan, because this came a day after the EU admonished Apple for violating the new Digital Markets Act, which just went into effect. Apple's already been fined nearly $2 billion for its app store policies. And that too stems from a lawsuit, this time by Spotify in 2019. So I guess what's happening is these regulatory bodies, especially in Europe, are following up on these lawsuits. They're taking several years, but they are really dropping the hammer on these guys. Uh, it's going to be interesting because the EU is much more aggressive and much more progressive in terms of its regulatory stance. And it's also much harder on privacy than in the U.S. Also, it has laws, which we don't, that are up to date. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, to, be, to me, and I'll maybe I was going to ask Lisa about this. Uh, does this really matter, though, to the customers or even does it even damage the brand name for these companies? 
because these actions and these lawsuits are and investigations are going to take years to unravel and unpack. At the end of the day, what what Microsoft is doing is it's a it's a very common go to market strategy. It's product bundles, and the pro- the intent of a product bundle, you know, is to really increase sales, which it did, uh, to improve customer satisfaction, which we have mixed data on, and also to improve competitive advantage, which is what the EU doesn't like. But at the end of the day, I think customers have the option to not use Teams. Now, Slack and, and Zoom and others are also saying it's not just the bundling of Teams, it's the interoperability problem that makes it difficult for those other platforms to work with other Microsoft tools. So Microsoft responded from a messaging perspective last year saying, all right, we're going to we're gonna unbundle Teams and the EU in Switzerland. And the EU, the e, uh, EC came back and said, insufficient. So dialed back to April just a few months ago, Microsoft said, okay, we'll unbundle this globally. Um, I took a look at the market share because that's something that was interesting to me. And I was looking at um, what Gartner, uh, Forrester, IDC were saying. And Microsoft does have significant market share in collaboration, cloud collaboration, unified communications. Slack and Zoom have pretty good market share as well. So I'm not sure that it's going to be a big hit for Microsoft. I think what Microsoft is doing from a messaging perspective is saying, or uh, is we're now going to give customers choice, which is what Mark Benioff was talking about on Twitter earlier this week, that it's about listening to what customers want. So I think it's going to be interesting. Microsoft has 10 weeks to respond to this, to see how they respond, what the message is coming up through their customer's voice that how that directs how they respond further. Yeah, I was going to kind of switch to, to Mitch and Mitchell. Um, in terms of developers, is this muddy the waters at all or does it impact them in any in any way or do they do they just continue to to, to forge forward i think it, it ties probably as much or more to the user experience john so and and part of what lisa is, is referring to if you kind of unpack bundling right there's bundling for pricing to get a better price there's also bundling as in integrating it more tightly in in the products and because collaboration is such and it goes hand in hand with 365, whether you're using Office and you want to have a meeting and share a document, or you're talking about calendaring and email. If if Teams is markedly easier to use or gets in the way of trying to use another service like Zoom, for example, or, or Slack or whatever it might be, that's when it really becomes an issue. Then they have a kind of an unfair advantage. We, we all expect Microsoft to be front and center about, have, we have Teams, we'd love to have you use it, make it easy to use. It's kind of back in the the search engine wars of what gets bundled with the browser, right? Which search engine do they make it hard to to uh, add it to that? It's kind of the same thing here. We're just talking about with collaborations for meetings. So I, I think it comes down to if I have to go through two or three steps to set up a meeting using Zoom, and I can do it in one in Team. Okay, is that because Zoom is harder to use, or is it because Microsoft has just made it? Harder for that uh, for the end user to use it with with the rest of them through sixty five. I, I have I have some thoughts on this, as one might imagine. Enough with beating up the big tech vendors, right? What do, let Let's send Microsoft into battle. Let's you know I, I'm reminded of the uh, Monty Python, right? Just flesh wound. Let's cut off one arm, half a leg, just a flesh wound. Get it out there because you know the Chinese and all of and vendors from other parts of the world. They, they, they're rubbing their hands in glee saying, okay, these guys, you know, you give the capitalists enough rope, they'll hang themselves. And that, that is, you know, we, we live in a world where a lot of, uh, a lot of buyers are looking to cut the amount of vendors they deal with. I want more bundles. I want more interoperability. I want one throat to choke instead of having to deal with 86 different vendors. Right. This is not Internet Explorer automatically being put into Windows. And when you buy a Windows PC, you automatically got Internet Explorer. This is Teams as part of Office 365, which, by the way, also includes PowerPoint and Word and Excel and, you know, a a number of other optional bundled items in there. That's that's Microsoft's advantage for, for building out this office, but it doesn't come default on the machine. You have to proactively download Office 365 the same way you have to proactively install Slack and or Zoom 
or or Citrix, uh, not Citrix, Cisco, uh, WebEx, mm-hmm. or or whatever else you want to use for collaboration. I I'm all for free and fair marketplaces, but I'm also all for that companies deserve to benefit from good work. And good work Microsoft has done here is they've transitioned what was a stodgy old office program into a, a SaaS product and have bundled in some best of breed type of functionality. And it I I just think the EU is totally off base here. And John, to your point about does the end user care? When we're talking twenty billion dollars, mm-hmm. that's, that's a lot of care. I don't care what the end user cares about. I mean, you know, twenty that's, billion I mean, yeah. dollars is a lot of money. I think also with the EU, um, just judging of some of the other rules and and everything, one of their key areas is transparency. So if enough people complained and said, like, even though you said you're making the choice to download it, then that's going to raise the eyebrow. And it'll be also interesting because what Lisa said, I agree with as well, the messaging now behind it, that going to linger, that message, oh, Microsoft is is not being honest with you. How are they not being honest, though? You know, it's interesting to me, there's a certain irony with all these regulatory issues, and there, there's so many. I mean, there's not just in Europe, but especially also now in the U.S., is that the customers have never been happier with the products they have, I think, based mm-hmm. on usage, based on their dependence on the products. So I guess what we now see is this pivot towards how competitors are hurt. And so what we see in this case with Slack and even the Spotify case involving Apple is the company's going to law enforcement and in a sense acting as a, as a, the uh, as a partner in, pro- in prosecuting a case against their competitor and i think that is actually the impetus for most of these investigations it's actually coming from the third party software hey, developer those are the people complaining and these yes. are the people who are complaining they are basically the driving force behind these investigations it's not independently the justice department or ftc they i think they are very dependent on these third parties and it takes a it takes a couple of years, but eventually it lands Microsoft now is in hot water after years of kind of being unscathed, of skating by. It was it was adhering by the rules and now look where it finds itself. Hey, I I'm I'm not a fan of this particular one. I, I and and I'm no Microsoft fanboy, but you know what they're done, I mean, and so what's next is well, Lotus isn't around anymore. But does someone else make a spreadsheet that says, uh, you know, bundling Excel in Office 365 gives Microsoft an unfair advantage and we're going to hit them for that? What happens with Google? I mean, I'm surprised Google, probably Google has already said that Office 365 is unfair because it it, it competes with us. That's that, that This goes against the spirit of what... We, we, Battle should be won in the marketplace by having a superior product, not by lobbying governments to to handcuff, you know, companies. Well, this, are, I think there's a bit of regulatory regret, though, too, by some of the, by some of the folks you mentioned, Alan, um, Internet Explorer, and I think about Netscape, dating myself, yeah. and Navigator, and maybe perhaps they think, well, not much was done, not enough was done back in the late '90s. And look what happened in Netscape. We don't, we don't want this to happen again. But you're right. I mean, Teams is later to market. It it's it did a phenomenal job. I mean, I, I use it as often as I use Slack or I use Zoom or WebEx. So in a sense, you know, the, the the spoils go to the victors who are have the products that people embrace. But I mean, that's hard. At the, I'm sorry, Mitch. Let me just jump real quick. On the Internet Explorer one, yes, I was a big Netscape fan too. We even use Netscape web server. But you know what? So Mozilla was given every advantage, right, that, that Netscape didn't have. And it didn't win. It lost. It, it, you don't see many people using Firefox anymore. What did win was Google's product. And it made, based on Chromium and, it, and, you know, irony of ironies, Microsoft's new edge or whatever they call their browser is also a Chromium-based browser. And, and you know, Google wound up Google, I think, still dominates that market. Um, so, you know, the best of intentions by governing and regulatory agencies line the road to perdition, right? Um, I, I just, the, the world economy and, and 
you know, the marketplace need to, to win out here. You, you can't, you, you just can't handicap these companies like that and, and expect them to remain competitive. Well, to me, it seems that th- this is intersection of two lines, right? Regulatory and competitiveness. As soon as Microsoft mm-hmm. catches up to, you know, before they had team, right? We were using every other product to do this. Now, with the addition of teams, is that caught up with uh, in functionality and in usability and people started adopting it? Now the competitors go to the regulatory agencies and say, this is unfair, right? Because they're Microsoft and they're big and they've got captured the customers, et cetera. Well, to your point, Alan, that's that's part of the advantage that they have. The real question is, are they doing something that's truly unfair? Or is it just that, you know, they're using our products and our product suites and it comes bundled with that. And beyond that, it's, you know, just us competing in the marketplace. Or is re- is Microsoft really doing something that's unfair? That's very unclear in this case. We haven't, I haven't seen anything that says, here's the practice you're doing, like in an antitrust kind of suit. Here's the, the pricing, or here's the way you're, you are boxing out the competition so they can't compete and work with your products. Yeah, I, I, I know. I'm at a loss. But you know what? I think we've given it its 15 minutes of, fran- of fame. Four more. <laughs> One more. We're going to take a break here on Tech Strong Gay Gang. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about you know, did Broadcom bite off more than it could chew in VMware? Or was it maybe less than it expected to chew? Well, we're going to talk about that. We're back here. You're watching Tech Strong Gang. Cloud Native Now is the web's leading resource for the growing cloud native ecosystem. CloudNativeNow.com is your destination for news, thought leadership, features, and webinars on cloud native architecture, Kubernetes, serverless, cloud native application development, microservices, service mesh, cloud native security, and more. Stay on the cutting edge of modern application development at Cloud Native Now. Hi, everyone. Back here on Tech Strong Gang. Our next topic for today involves our friends at Broadcom. And, you know, they, they've been uh, working and evolving the VMware portfolio. And they recently came out with a, a, a functionality of streamlined DevOps workflows. And actually, Mitch, you know you know a lot about this particular one. Why don't you take it? Sure. Let me, let me kind of kick things off. Um, you know, VMware is in the news for a lot of topics, for a lot of reasons, um, after being acquired by by Broadcom. They've, they made an announcement they're coming out with, with actually rebranding vSphere as cloud foundation. Yeah. And that term is something you see in other cloud services that kind of implies things like patterns and architectures and blueprints for how to, how to do things, templates, if you will. And that's precisely, precisely what they've done is create templates that make it kind of easier for DevOps teams. And I would imagine platform engineers to also self provision their environments for doing development, testing, et cetera, uh, on top of their private cloud. So it, it's, you know, we're, we're seeing VMware, in addition to its strength in the operational kind of side of, of the world, whether it's uh, in private cloud or, or in, in public cloud somewhat, but also trying to get into the DevOps workflow, into the software development workflow. And uh, so it isn't just about containerizing your application and building your own environments. You could be doing that on top of, uh, on top of uh, VMware, vSphere, in effect. Um, for development test all the way into production. So it's it's interesting to see that they're trying to move up. Of course, they have Tanzu Kubernetes, and this ties into the 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 grid service that's available for, for that. So VMware continues to expand and kind of move up the stack somewhat, and this seems to be a, a good move for that. I'm cur- curious, um, Lisa, your perspective on this too, given... Um, Broadcom kind of in the market and being, I'm mean, excuse me, VMware being acquired by Broadcom in the, in the market and what the perceptions are and maybe what some of the things is this going to help them with their customers? Interestingly, I go back to the four piece of marketing here, pricing, positioning, or, or the first two things that jumped out at me, obviously, consolidating 168 products, 9,000 SKUs, and they were very vocal in the last few months about, we made it really challenging for our customers to be able to uh, to integrate. We kind of left our customers up to being the systems integrators and they didn't really get that single consistent experience. So they've been very vocal um, in their messaging about the challenges that they're aware that they delivered to the audience. So I thought that was a, a, a wise, transparent view 
But I also go back to Broadcom's acquisition strategy in its past, kind of the acquire X sort of thing there. So um, we know some of the things that they're doing is they want to make consistent changes to deliver that consistent customer experience, which is what customers want. They are also updating to a subscription model. So a, a big change there for VMware. And that their go-to-market strategy to me shows Broadcom is listening to the existing VMware customers. With that said, we know Hawk 10 has been very vocal about we're going to be investing heavily in R&D, which to me signifies not a lot of investment in marketing. So I think what they're going to be focused on here is preservation of existing customers. I don't see them. I see them working on cross-sell opportunities here as they make things easier, more consistent, and and really respond to what the, the DevOps teams want. But I think they're going to be focused on helping the most profitable customers stay. And I don't see them really going after with this net new logos. Fair. I, you know, look, with all due respect to Broadcom and VMware, VMware had issues, has issues, right? And and probably the biggest issue, I think, from VMware is the, the move in the market from just infrastructure as a service on top of a hypervisor to true cloud native platform as a service and and Tanzu is is their bet for cloud native and kubernetes and you know platform as a service but the bulk of their revenue and their customers are using v, what was vSphere and and the other you know hypervisor based products and so you know i think broadcom knew this going in that they were buying in in what in essence is a, is a diminishing asset in in the marketplace if they didn't revitalize things and 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 kind of modernize it if you will so i i think this represents an attempt at doing that there's two two pieces of it number one is getting tanzu bigger better you know having a better better bigger chunk of the of the cloud native market and number two is, you know, it's more than just renaming. I, I think it's it's making cloud foundation, if that's the new word, more relevant to today's cloud audience. And um, whether that is going to influence DevOps teams or workflows or or make it more uh, cool, if you will, to 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 the user base. Is is remains to be seen. I, I I'm not I'm not 100 percent sold on it. It seems to me they've got to win over the platform engineering crowd because that's yeah. more and more who's providing these platforms to development and test yeah. and multiple environments, which also in some cases do DevOps. Yeah, they they manage the DevOps tools as well. But that seems who I would go after. Mm-hmm. And I didn't see that. In, I'm sorry, yeah, John. Oh no, I I think he's right. Ultimately, probably the goal is to provide the platform engineers and application developers with a frictionless experience. You know, the one thing I, I would like kick quick aside, whenever I hear the words Broadcom and VMware, I get triggered into thinking about user confusion and pricing, threading. And I think one of the goals here is to make pricing for VMware software more consistent across multiple platforms because there exists this perception that the company raised prices when it eliminated perpetual licenses for VMware software. So if that's their ultimate goal, perhaps there's a lot of value in that. I would help. Well, they also, besides trying to make pricing more uniform, they also, you know, I don't know if it was open source or they just made free. A lot of the kind of VMware, you know, the consumer, if you will, products that they don't want to play it. Right, they're trying to streamline. I think the VMware product line to concentrate on, you know, make their bets where they want to. They think they'll get the greatest return. Yeah, the the, the desktop products that now are free, right? Essentially, mm-hmm. mean for individual users. You know, that's not where their bread and butter is. It's in the data center. And no, they're giving them away for free. They're it's clearly, and that's where Broadcom plays, right? That's where their hardware is too, in the data centers and. And so forth. So it, it'll be interesting to see. And I also, Mitchell, you and I discussed this. I, I guess it was on the DevOps chat podcast we just recorded. Um, 
it'll be interesting to see how long a runway they give Tanzu to make real headway in the uh, in the cloud native space, right? Because you know the old saying, if you're not in the top three, get the heck out. And so if Tanzu's not in the top three, how long is Broadcom going to stay in there? Well, that's another reason why I think it, you have to push beyond IT ops or cloud ops um, for VMware because those decisions don't usually get made by IT ops. That's that's made as part of the kind of op, the IT, IT or the application stack, right? That we're running for Kubernetes or running other tools within. Again, tends to go back to platform engineering. So, I think they've got to win over that crowd in a big way to really. I think they could make substantial headway if they did that. Agreed. Agreed. Well, well VMware Explorer is coming up and just, sorry, Alan, the no. Explorer Legacy uh, show coming up in just about six weeks or so. So it'll be interesting there to see what additional messaging and positioning we hear. Yeah. Um, Mitch, to your comment, are they going to be expanding their target audience? Are they going to be going up that stack? Then maybe we'll find out more. I suspect we will in about six weeks time. Great point. Well, I hope we'll have some future folks there. I bet we will. Good. I'm looking forward to seeing that. All right, let's take a quick break here on Textron Gang. Coming back, you know, we were lucky to have Bonnie Schneider here. She is our uh, sustainability and green IT expert. And we're going to hear from her regarding NVIDIA. Just give us a moment. Hey, we're back here on Tech Strong Gang. You know, as I mentioned right before the break, we're really lucky to have Bonnie Schneider here as part of our Tech Strong Gang. And she's been part of Tech Strong now for a, a year or more. You know, Bonnie's background, if you don't know, is as a professional meteorologist. She's also a, a multiple time author on, on climate change and, and what's going on in the world. And she's been manning the, the Echo Insights desk here, which is really around sustainability, green IT initiatives, et cetera. And, you know, she's developed a real expertise in this. And, and at some point you go, you cross the chasm from going to talking to people and learning about a subject to becoming an expert on the subject. And given Bonnie's background in meteorology and climate change and sustainability, the natural progression is for her to, in and of herself, to become an analyst expert in the field. And, and that's what she is. So you're going to see a lot of new content from Bonnie around her opinions on issues around sustainability and green IT. And she's here to tell you about her first one. <laughs> Go ahead, Bonnie. Alan, great introduction. Well, you know, uh, we've been talking a lot over the past week, um, NVIDIA being the world's most valuable company. Now, I know that that news uh, teetered a little bit earlier this week, but still, um, it's their, their rise has been monumental to follow. So I was curious to see about the sustainability initiatives that the CEO Jensen Huang is is taking on um, with the introduction of Blackwell GPUs and, and to see how that all shapes up. So I took a closer look at NVIDIA. Hi, everyone. I'm Bonnie Schneider with your Ecotech Analyst Insights. NVIDIA's ascendance to the world's most valuable publicly listed company highlights its dominance in the AI chip market. But this rapid rise also raises questions about AI's environmental impact. For example, this year alone, NVIDIA's high-end microchips are projected to surpass the power consumption of entire small nations. This presents a significant sustainability challenge. How can tech innovation align with eco-responsibility? 
NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang offers a unique perspective. He argues that the use of millions of AI GPUs will actually reduce overall power consumption. The CEO says this is achievable through accelerating computations and enabling more efficient inferencing. NVIDIA's upcoming Blackwell GPUs will consume up to one kilowatt each. Despite their high-powered usage, they are designed to complete AI tasks faster, potentially saving on overall energy use. NVIDIA is also leveraging generative AI in their intelligent product recommendation tool, which helps create digital twins for complex industrial products, optimizing design and minimizing waste. Can NVIDIA maintain its top spot in AI while effectively managing its carbon footprint? The ongoing efforts of the world's most valuable company suggest a promising path forward. NVIDIA's balance of AI innovation with sustainability will be key to its long-term success and future global impact. As you can see, Jensen Huang does have a very innovative way of seeing how energy use and AI can actually intertwine, especially when processes are done faster. In his opinion, you're using less energy. He also talked about uh, as well um, using AI to create off-grid energy. So I think this thinking out of the box, rather than looking at it, the glass is half empty, is glass is half full, is is part of the perspective. We're going to use AI to do great things. Yes, it's going to tap into our energy grid, but perhaps we can use AI to create additional grids to look for power sources we never even thought were possible. Interesting. You know, to me, it sounds a little like alchemy. We're going to turn lead into gold. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Gang, anybody else have anything to say? I, I have a question for Bonnie. And by the way, we, we love Bonnie and love the work that you're doing. We're so privileged to have you here. Um, I'm curious your sense of the credibility um, of your conversation uh, with him about this. Now, obviously, there's messaging and telling the story and sometimes – there, th there's more story than than fact. What's your sense of it? Are you, you think there's a lot of credibility behind what they're doing? Yeah, I really do. Especially when you look at their rapid rise uh, to success, I think we don't know yet. You know, one of the things that's tough about this is that it's very hard to measure the amount of energy AI uses, how to track it. That's still um, being discovered and figured out. So it's sort of a good. This is a good point in history to say what he's saying that, you know, this is actually going to save us energy because we don't really have the data to say that he's wrong. So I mm -hmm. think judging on his success so far, um, that we're likely to see that. And one of the other things that's what's fascinating about NVIDIA is all the partnerships that they're doing with different energy companies, you know, to stay on top of it, to do real time monitoring, um, as well to, to get the answers for that. But using AI also as, as a part of climate solutions is, is another big area, I think, that a lot of these big tech companies are getting into and will continue to, continue to do. You know, we just had a report, Alan, we we're talking about this with Google um, in Finland, how they're doing a state-of-the-art new data center that's mm -hmm. going to um, help to heat the entire community around it. So it's, it is it is interesting to see the innovations. It's still a really smart story, Bonnie. Um, I, you know, one quick question. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no. no. Quick question I want to ask you about was the peers of NVIDIA who are relatively older have been grappling with this. I'm thinking about Apple and Google and their efforts in terms of environmental responsibility. Do you think NVIDIA, because it is relatively younger, has some sort of advantage? You mentioned the embrace of, of AI, but maybe there's technology that's come along that makes it easier for them to, to can address the carbon footprint. Yeah, I do. And I think with this uh, Blackwell chip in particular, it's, 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 projected to be 25 times more efficient than any other previous model. So they're going into this saying, yes, we're using the AI, but, but what we're developing um, processes everything faster. And like I was saying earlier, that will in turn uh, use less energy. So I absolutely think that. You know, John, I, the, I, I'm sorry, good, Lisa. Sorry, um, thanks. I took a look at NVIDIA's FY24 sustainability report and, and the things Kind of much to your point and Bonnie to yours that that struck me were all of the customer examples they provided when they say NVIDIA accelerated computing saves energy. And they've got data there that shows that um before it was consuming 10x to 20x more cost and energy. They also talked about to, to Bonnie's point, 
Training AI consumes energy, but applying AI saves energy. They talked about some customers there, Portland General Electric, for example, how they're using NVIDIA AI inside electric meters to direct more renewable power resources to the power grid. I think they're the, the, it struck me as the numbers, the customer, um, the the proof points that I had was was quite transparent, and I think lends a lot of credibility to what we're doing. I think they're right. I think that transparency is key because it would be one thing if they were to argue, well, we're not really using a lot of energy. We know that that's not the case. So, um, taking this approach and seeing how AI can um, be in turn to be used in tandem with a power company to optimize energy is key. And and I think they're leading in this space for sure. They are your point, Bonnie, them, them being a newer company, a younger company, as opposed, you know, we know a lot of other folks who are coming or working on coming to market with their chips, right? With AI chips. Um, but take an Intel, for example, that's, that's doing their own fab now. It, it, it's one thing for Intel to come out with a story around green and uh, sustainability for their AI chip. But that, that's in the context of the larger Intel story, right? And how green is, is Intel. It seems to me NVIDIA is in a position to really claim a space in sustainability and what they're doing that they can differentiate from others because they can holistically talk about that story much greater than an existing uh, chip company. I makes think that, that that makes sense, especially when you think of who's leading in sustainability. Typically, Apple comes to mind. Um, but you're right. I think that as a younger company um, and and as a leader, of course, in the AI industry, for sure, um, they can definitely um, have the opportunity to do that. And they also talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of their sustainability program. And I was impressed to read that 50% of their board of directors is made up of racially or gender diverse people. So they're maybe as a newer company, they're they're taking that well-rounded mm-hmm. ESG approach, which does include DEI. and i They're definitely a child of their times. But before we saint them, okay, confer <laughs> sainthood upon them. So in the, in NVIDIA? <laughs> yeah, same <laughs> NVIDIA. Uh, but, you know, before we do that, let's also remember a large part of this is a knee-jerk reaction to the fact that their chips are blowing up power, you, you know, and for a good reason, right? Everybody wants AI. Everybody wants to run AI calculations and, you know, computations, and all of those AI usages and, and with these chips are blowing up, uh, you know, our ability to support them with electricity yeah. and, and, and heat dissipation and, you know, the whole data center space. If, you know, they, to a certain extent, they created a problem and they're now trying to solve it. They're trying to get ahead of the problem that they're creating. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there's a little bit of self-service going sure. on here. And no, not, you know, happened. I hope, hope no. no one in the EU hears that and starts an investigation <laughs> over it. But well, one of the um, competitors has to go to the EU and well, right, one of the, Intel will probably go that. there and say, "Hey, Nvidia is unfairly <laughs> heating the planet." So okay. tune in tomorrow. We'll yeah, be talking so about that. Probably. <laughs> and there's so much unknown. You know, we know that our electric grid is aging, um, and we just don't know yet how much can it handle. And I think that's going to be um, something that we'll see going forward. And if you look at what Jensen Huang says, that it looks like the the AI will help stop that problem too. So I agree with you. There has to be some balance there. Yeah. I mean, and I'll just close this one out with, you know what? Our, our friends at Futurum, Daniel uh, Newman, CEO of Futurum, has had uh, several interviews with Jensen. They are available. I think they're on the 6.5 Media site, okay. if that Futurum group site. So if you want to, you know, hear from Jensen directly, I direct you to go check those out as well. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back with uh, uh, an Andy Rooney kind of segment here from our good friend, Roll Bob, Bob Russellman. We'll be right back here. You're watching Tech Strong Gang. Ever wonder what the tech brothers who have made a lot of money in technology do with it all? Bob Russellman does. In fact, he thinks that buying big mansions and islands in the Caribbean is just the low hanging fruit. He thinks there's more to be had. Let's take a listen. All right, so this is a story about tech bros, and it goes like this. Elon Musk's net worth in 2023 was about $232 billion. And in 2024, Tesla is going to give him another $46 billion in a pay package. That's a lot of money. How much money? Well, for a little old me, if I were to spend a million dollars a year, it would take me $232,000. 400 years to spend it all. A 
almost a quarter of a million years to spend that amount of money. That's longer than Homo sapiens have been walking around planet Earth. But it may sound like a lot of money, but I don't think Elon Musk has it lying around in cash. He probably has a lot of it in non liquid assets. But that doesn't mean he couldn't buy some serious stuff. So, for example, he could buy an aircraft carrier. Right. A Gerald Ford aircraft carrier, a Gerald Ford class aircraft carrier, costs $37 billion. That's a drop in a bucket for Musk take a loan, put up some of his Tesla stock, and he's rowing the seven seas and an aircraft carrier. There might be not be any planes on the aircraft carrier, but who cares? He has the aircraft carrier, go forward, Elon. Now, I don't think Elon wants an aircraft carrier. I think what he wants is a lot of satellites, and he has them. Elon Musk has about 1,655 satellites circling planet Earth. That's more than the Chinese Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation, and the European Space Agency combined. In other words, Musk and his companies are just as big a player in space as NASA. And maybe, if he wanted to, he could have his own space force. He has all the stuff. He has the money. He has the technology. And he could hire the people, send them to space in his own rockets, and he's patrolling planet Earth. Now, here's something to think about. What happens to the public space when private individuals take over? What happens when the tech bros have more spaceships, satellites, and communication infrastructure than a sovereign state? Let's go one step further. What happens when these tech bros become a sovereign state? I mean, if it walks like a duck, and if it talks like a duck, then it's a sovereign state. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's a duck. I mean, a private corporation could never become a sovereign state, could it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe that's something to think about. You know, I love watching, I love hearing from Bob and real Bob. He has a unique wit and view of the world. I would say it's not just mansions and islands. They also buy beautiful resorts, as is the case here in Boca Raton. Not going to get into it. But um, thank you, Bob, for that. And thank you for watching us on Tech Strong Gang. You know, we're going five days a week, and that means tomorrow, Friday, we'll be back with a whole new show. Our gang will be assembled and, uh, topics of the day to be discussed. But until then, uh, John, Mitch, Lisa, Bonnie, thanks for joining. I'm Alan Schimmel. You've just watched the Tech Strong Gang. SecurityBoulevard.com is the leading resource for news, analysis, and education on challenges facing the cybersecurity industry. SecurityBoulevard.com covers all aspects of cybersecurity, including data security, DevSecOps, cloud security, application security, network security, security threats, and more. SecurityBoulevard.com has the largest selection of security content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.securityboulevard.com to learn more. SecurityBoulevard.com, home of Security Bloggers Network.